last week, last Monday, we were learning how to normalize a database from bad data. So you had data which was not even database ready. It's in this form. It's not even in the first normal form. It, it has repeating groups here, which is there's no way to put that onto a database because you don't know how many groups are going to repeat. And we learned how to walk through from zero normal form to first to second to third normal form. That was what we did. It, if you remember correctly, what we did here is we split off the item table and we um, had a problem still because you had two items with different price, the same item with two different prices. So we realized we needed to have a vendor item relationship table because there was a many to many relationship between vendors and items. And the unit price would be an attribute on the relationship table. So you solve for a many to many relationship and you put the unit price on the table. That's where we left off. But now let's, we're going to do the same concept from a different starting point. That was the starting point of having data that was in the zero normal form and getting it to the third normal form. In your world, in your project, you're starting from a logical design and going to a physical design, a different thing. We're going to learn how to develop a database that way. So if we think about the systems development life cycle, you'd start off with some kind of an enterprise model. You then would create a conceptual data model and then a logical data model or logical database design and then a physical database design. So here could be our conceptual model. Remember this? We don't have to go through it again. I'm just showing you. You start off here and then you say, you know what, we're really doing the human resources cycle. Let's understand how to do the human resources cycle. You would then have some kind of a logical database design. So you get to this point. You have your narrative. You create a logical database design from your narrative. And you use this as a starting point to create your physical database design. And you know we, there are certain things we know. We know that every entity most likely will become a table. Each rectangle will most likely become a table. We know that if there's a one-to-many relationship here somewhere, you then have to have a foreign key to handle the one-to-many relationship. And we know that there's a many-to-many -many relationship between two entities. You need to create a new table to handle that many-to-many -many relationship, which would be a relationship table. So between purchases and cash disbursements, zero to n there, one to n there. That's a many-to-many -many relationship. You look at the maxes there. And so that would be a, a purchase slash, slash cash disbursement relationship table right there. So you can actually look at your logical design. And by seeing the cardinalities, you can figure out how many tables there will be in your database. Take a look at this logical design and make a guess within your team. How many tables do you think there are? Each team will make a guess. How many tables will we end up with from this logical design? Start off with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's a good starting point, 9. OK, each box is an entity. Every entity gets a table. So we'll start off with 9. So the first thing you do is you create a table for each entity. You create a relationship table for each many-to-many -many entity, including situations where there's, a, where there's an optionality. You might have to move some of your attributes to the relationship table, as you saw we did with price on that last example. And then you look at your mandatory one-to-ones and decide whether you want to link them into a single table. So you can actually you could lose tables. Um, 
Then you define your primary keys. You implement your foreign keys for the one-to-many relationships. You put the one side on the many. Put the one side on the many. Let's see. OK. So we have a many-to-many -many relationship. What's that going to do to us? Add a table. So we start off 9 plus 1. Is that the only many-to-many? -many? Yeah. A purchase order could have one-to-many cash disbursements. A cash disbursement could have zero-to-many purchase orders. That's many-to-many. -many. Any other many-to-many's we should be thinking about here? One to N, one to N, one to N. I don't see any others. OK. But now you have this mandatory relationship one to one. So according to our rules, you subtract one there. <laughs> Wherever you had a one to many, like in sell and customer, you'd put the foreign key from the customer on the sale. OK? So here's your actual. And you'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Because uh -oh. oh, they just, you know what? A couple of things here. They just didn't give Jesse a table. I don't buy it. So I would have accepted here. Any of those three? Yeah. No, but you have a head start to getting it right on the midterm. <laughs> I would accept eight because they say there is no Jesse table, but there should be a Jesse table. Jesse's a real entity. That's one. I'd accept nine because they say you should combine the sale into a mandatory one to one. And I'd accept 10 because, in my view, Mandatory one-to-ones are dangerous because you create a transitive dependency. You're actually going away from third normal form when you combine that. Because information about the cell is going to be related to the other information. On the exam, do you want us to draw the, uh, the relationship in circles? All I need to see is this. I just need to see the entities. I don't need to see these things. I need to see the entities. And one of the two ways I see I need to see your cardinality. But I don't I don't need to see the, these diamonds here. I don't need to see these. Okay? Is that what your question was? <laughs> metadata. Remember we talked about metadata? Data about data? The physical design of the database, as you design your database, you're actually going to design your at define your attributes. And when you define your attributes, you're going to define the metadata about that, those attributes. You're going to say that social security number is a nine-digit text field. You could have said it was an 11-digit field because you could put the dashes in it, right? So you have to um, define your data. It says, here you're defining it as a text field, but you're also going to give it the option of being um, numeric sometimes. Is the field required in the database? If it's the primary key, it has to be required. If it's an attribute, it may not be required. Not everyone has a cell phone. Or more likely, not everyone else, not everyone has a home phone, a landline. So some fields are required, some fields are not. Primary keys are always required. By setting it up as a certain field type text, numeric, date, um, you create the situation where if someone types the wrong thing in, it will reject it immediately. If somebody tried to put in, uh, you know, if you said your customer number had to be numeric and somebody tried to put in let letters, it wouldn't even allow them to be entered. So it gives an immediate rejection. You'll also learn how to create input masks pretty soon which allows you, like for the social security number, as you're typing it in, the dashes will automatically start to show up. You've seen that. Uh, or you type the telephone and the brackets start showing up in the telephone number. And so those are input masks. They help the user 
you know, manage what they're entering and it looks more, more realistic to them. You'll be able to put in default values. This is a dangerous thing to do. It's a great thing to do. Let's say you're Amazon. You might put in the default value for quantity bought as one, right? And so every time somebody goes in to buy something that defaults to one, and if you want to buy five, you have to do something to make it five. So that, in that way, default value is good. But you want to be careful not to always use default values. If you're the person who's data entering, key entering, the number of hours people are work, worked in a week, you know, you, by looking at time cards that they wrote their information on, you don't want that to default to 40 hours. You want that to be explicitly typed in. So depending upon the purpose of the attribute, sometimes you'll have a default value, sometimes you won't. Sometimes you'll have a, something called a drop-down list. You've seen it a hundred times, a thousand times, where this is the violation code on that um, parking or drive, driving ticket thing. It'll drop down all the possibilities. You see it all the time with states, right? You want to enter a state, you type in the N, and you know, I find it very annoying, by the way. I think they should be able to fix this. So you want, because we live in New Jersey, right? And so Nebraska's in front of us. Who else is, is that the only one? New Mexico, New Hampshire, we're fourth, right? And so when you type in that N, it just gets to Nebraska. And then you got to scroll down. Why doesn't it just show you all four of the Ns? You know you want the N. You want to just, it always shows you the first N. So that's the drop down list. You can also put in validation rules like the number has to be between 1 and 100. Maybe Amazon doesn't want anyone to buy more than 100 of something. They know it's a game. So they make it a maximum of 100. 100 you know, 55 inch TVs. And if you do that, you also can put in the text. You know, what you do in, this is pretty much what you're going to do in Microsoft Access, something like this. You put in the text, which is the, you know, the words that you want to pop up uh, in the box when somebody makes a mistake. The fine must be between one and a hundred dollars. That's a range value. Referential integrity. When we work with Microsoft Access, we will always, yeah, this is going to be a little obscure right now because you're not in the system, which we will hopefully maybe get into on Monday, if not Monday, Wednesday of next week. We will always enforce referential integrity, which means we will always ensure that there's a primary key for our foreign key. So when you go to set up your tables, you'll be setting it up with enforced referential integrity. All part of our 